Now I'm going to invite to the stage our next speaker, uh, Mr. Andrew McCutter Bicknell. Uh, and he's also going to talk about uh, competitive um, uh, marketing, competitive strategy. His talk is Crushing Competitors in a Saturated Markets. How to start? Yeah. And you say something. It says that I'm using my MacBook speakers. So hopefully audio isn't too bad, but okay, cool. No, that's gotcha. great. Yeah. All right. All right. Sorry about Stage the technical difficulties there. No okay. worries, mate. Cool. Appreciate it. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quick. I have a few slides that I'm going to share. All right. Cool. Everyone see my screen? I got a thumbs up. I just want to make sure I'm using this platform correctly. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right. Cool. So, hey everyone, I'm Andy McCotter Becknell. Appreciate you uh, sticking around through the technical difficulties, but I'm the current head of competitive intelligence over at ClickUp and the former competitive uh, head over at Zoom Info. So, I had the pleasure of building the programs from the ground up at both of those companies and in saturated markets, right? So, ClickUp being in the project management market, Zoom Info being in the sales and marketing intelligence market. So, we're going to go through a chapter from a broader course that I'm building called the competitive playbook. And we're going to specifically focus on how you can start your program. And the reason that I felt really strongly about covering this topic is because in my experience, uh, right, getting started was always the hardest part. And that's for a few reasons, right? So number one, um, without a formal program in place, knowledge within your organization is going to be really scattered and inconsistent. Different people are going to know different things depending on if they're sales or in product or if they're a leadership position. Um, they're going to be using different resources or assets to help tell the competitive story. And they're all going to have really varied experiences and opinions. Two, uh, you're only one person, right? And in most cases, you have responsibilities outside of competitive intelligence. I'm sure that a lot of folks here are also working on content personas, messaging, and enablement, amongst other things. And then three, especially in the case of saturated markets, you know, it's unclear who you should even be paying attention to in the first place. So sure, there's always like the two or three brand names that everyone's familiar with, but there's dozens, sometimes hundreds of other competitors that you could consider after those leaders. And if you saw Pep session a half hour ago, then these charts are going to be really familiar to you. Uh, the chart on the left is the MarTech 5000 from 2019. So a few years old, but still a pretty overwhelming view of the marketing technology landscape. And then the four uh, charts on the right are just four grids out of hundreds that are maintained by G2. And so for those also that aren't aware, G2 is essentially like the Yelp for B2B software. And unless you're up and to the right in these grids, it's close to impossible to see where you stand uh, compared to your competitors. So with these pain points in mind, I'm going to help you avoid mistakes that I've made in the past and help you hit the ground running with your competitive Intel programs. And I bucketed my recommendations into four steps that we'll cover in depth today. First, we're going to talk about narrowing your, the scope of your competitive landscape and honing in on the ones that have the potential to make the most impact on your business. Then I'll give you a simple framework to help uh, help you identify the gaps in your landscape for your company to fill. And then we'll walk through some growth levers that you should be aware of just generally in 2022, right? These are going to be non-product uh, based differentiators. These are going to be uh, points that are just essentially telling you how businesses are growing and differentiating today outside of the product. And then we'll uh, bring it all together at the very end. We're going to give ourselves an evergreen goal for our program and some guardrails just to make sure that we stay on track. Okay. So first, let's start out by uh, talking about narrowing our scope, right? Because again, we have all of these different competitors and we need to figure out right, how we can organize them and uh, not get too overwhelmed by the sea of different vendors within our landscape. And between you and me, the majority of these vendors don't even deserve your attention, to be honest. Unless you're a really large company with multiple offerings spanning multiple categories, um, you aren't going to be losing deals to dozens and dozens and dozens of different vendors. Typically, there are 10 competitors that have the potential to make an impact on your business every single year. 
These are the businesses that you should pay attention to and take seriously. Maybe 12, maybe eight, but uh, 10 is generally a safe number to shoot for. So how do we find these vendors? One really way is uh, by asking a couple of questions. Who are we being evaluated against and who are we replacing? Uh, sometimes, you know, the answers will overlap, but in my experience, these are two distinct groups. First, um, who you're being evaluated against. It's typically the category darling at the time. Uh, take a look at the category that you're competing in on G2. Filter by who's trending. The leaders will be companies that are investing dollars in customer reviews and are getting really great feedback. It's often, you know, that those companies are also investing in customer proof points and their brand and go to market. So you'll recognize them most likely if you've been in the space for a little while. Out of the 10 competitor goal that we set at the beginning of this slide a few minutes ago, you'll likely find six or seven of them by asking this question. And then the remaining three will come from the next question. Who are you replacing? You can probably rattle a few of these ones, you know, off the top of your head. You know, they're the category leaders typically. They're the sales forces, the Zooms, HubSpots of the world. Another way to look at it is whatever the status quo is for your category. Now, when you feel good about those 10 competitors that you narrowed your category down to, run it by your sales team. They'll tell you if they regularly run into them or not. And bonus points also, you know, if you have these as mandatory fields in your CRM, um, that's a surefire way to make sure that you're staying up to date on who's being, uh, on who you're consistently being evaluated against or replacing. Okay, so now that you have your 10 competitors, I'm going to uh, walk you through another exercise that I put together called the 3C framework. This is going to really help you identify the gaps uh, or the opportunities that your company can take advantage of. So keep in mind that all company strategies fit into one of three buckets, competing, carving, or creating. And as I describe these strategies, think about your category, okay? I'll bet that specific vendors will come to mind as we go through each of these. The first strategy is competing for market share. These companies typically have very flexible pricing. They double down on being easy to use. They have solid SEO. They're easy to find. Um, and are just great typically at a few really important things. The second strategy is carving a niche. These companies target a specific persona, industry, or segment within an existing category. So video conferencing for educators, CRMs for small businesses, project management for creative agencies. Okay. The last strategy is creating a category, arguably the most expensive and time consuming option, but most fruitful if you can get it right. These companies are creating a unique narrative uh, and positioning. They're investing heavily in educating the market on why it's important. And typically, not always typically, not always, but typically, they act as a consolidator of a lot of different use cases and workflows. So think Gong with revenue intelligence. HubSpot with inbound marketing or Qualtrics with experience management. The most important thing about this exercise though, uh, isn't to determine what strategy is good or bad for your competitors. It's to determine what gaps exist that you can fill. You might find that your top competitors are all niching down on different personas or industries, but nobody's offering a simple affordable all-in-one solution. Or maybe you're seeing a larger market trend that nobody else is pursuing. This might be a potential opening for you to create a new category and claim that market trend for yourself. So stay open-minded and you'll be surprised by you know, the different opportunities that you find from this exercise. Okay, now let's take a look at how our competitors got to where they are. Um, regardless of the strategy that you are pursuing or that they're pursuing, I should say, Every company uses a combination of different growth levers. The most successful companies aren't just offering a different product. Sure, they may have started out leaning on product-based differentiation, but that's not how they scaled. It's easier than ever 
for companies to copy feature functionality. So if you want really long-term growth, you have to invest in a few of these other areas too. So today, some of the most common growth levers that I've seen personally in 2022 are community, brand, education, and ecosystem. Lemlist, who Pep highlighted uh, in his session as well as in the chat, um, they're a great example of a company that uses community to their advantage. They're niching down on the sales engagement category, and they have a really avid community that shares feature requests and email templates. So definitely a great example of community. Drift is a great example of a company that used brand and education to help create the conversational marketing category. They educated the, uh, the market on how bots can qualify higher leads uh, or higher quality leads, I should say, compared to forms and at a higher quantity. And people trusted them because their brand was everywhere. They were doing LinkedIn takeovers, their own conference, hypergrowth. They wrote their own book all before those things were commonplace in B2B now. So their brand is super recognizable now. So long story short, um, when you're evaluating those 10 competitors that you narrowed your scope down to, look beyond product-based differentiation. Yes, it's important to know how products are different from yours, but you know, it's also very, very important to know how your competitors' businesses are growing. Okay, last step. So you've done the hard part. Uh, you've narrowed your scope. You've identified your competitor strategies and you've figured out what their growth levers are. Um, so now your goal is to maintain that awareness and enable the folks around you as well. Okay, so Zanshin is a word that represents this ideal state. It's a state of awareness and relaxed alertness in Japanese martial arts. Sounds, sounds nice, right? You know, so a, a competitor released a, a surprise new uh, tier one feature. You're ready. A competitor announces a new round of funding or an acquisition. You're ready. A competitor is gaining momentum. You're ready. Instead of giving an example of a company that did this really well, I'm going to give instead a an example of a company that didn't do this well. Back in the 70s, only two American brewers mattered, Anheuser-Busch and Schlitz. At least that was the opinion of the CEO of Anheuser-Busch. They had been battling Schlitz for decades and didn't notice that Miller Brewing was gaining momentum. Miller started the decade out in fifth place in the 70s with just 4% market share. They invested really heavily in brand and R&D. Those were their growth levers. And then they released the first ever light beer, Miller Lite. And Anheuser-Busch didn't do anything about it until the very end of the decade. And by that point, Miller had soared up into second place, ousting Schlitz. And so it's this kind of Cinderella story for Miller, uh, for Miller Brewing. But at the end of the day, Anheuser-Busch was able to retain the number one spot, but just barely because they started to finally do something at the very end of the day. So keep in mind, business is all about how you respond to the unexpected, whether you simply react or if you act. And these three activities at the bottom of this slide are going to help you make those informed decisions of acting or reacting. So conduct these, uh, you know, these um, landscape assessments every year with a really critical eye. Go through these first three steps that I talked about. Update your battle cards for your sales team on a quarterly basis. Um, unless something really major happens, that's going to change the way you sell. Um, but otherwise, try to do it just once a quarter. Otherwise, you're going to be sinking too much time into that every single day. And then um, conduct win-loss interviews on an ongoing basis as well. Okay, uh, so let's review. Here's how you should start your competitive intelligence program in a saturated market. First, narrow down right your scope to about 10-ish vendors. Um, and to guide this exercise, make sure you're asking yourself and some other stakeholders within your company who you're replacing and who you're being evaluated against. Next, identify a gap among those competitors. Um, that's going to be your opportunity to differentiate. Use the 3C framework uh, to bucket who's competing, carving a niche, or creating a category. Third, go deeper with each of these companies' strategies. So try to go beyond feature comparisons. Uh, try to understand more their growth levers, community, brand, education, ecosystem. Those are all really big growth levers right now. 
there are others as well. So make sure that you do your homework and figure out exactly how your competitors' businesses are growing. And last but not least, make sure you pick a direction and execute. Maintain your awareness as well. So keep a close eye on the market, update your landscape assessments, battle cards, and win-loss programs accordingly. Again, I am Andy McCotter Bicknell. If you like this presentation, I post content about competitive intel about every single day on LinkedIn. And I'm also building a digital course uh, that you can register for called the Competitive Playbook that should be published in about a month. So let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, so yeah, guys, post your questions in the questions tab. That includes you, Dragos. Dragos is asking, what was the ARR of ClickUp when you joined? I don't think I'm allowed to share that. That's a good question, but I don't think I'm what allowed to. What is it today? What is it today? I'm sorry. I wish I could answer, or I wish I felt more confident in knowing the answer, but I'm going to err on the side of caution. We, uh, I'm sure that actually, now that I think about it, I bet if you Google it, you can probably find some roundabout answer, but I'm not going to be the one With it. your, I think, head of growth person uh, was floating numbers, I think 70, 80 million, something like this. I forget. Sure. Sure. That sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> We'll get with that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, cool. Andrew, can you tell a story or do you know of companies who did this very methodically, just like you said, like they entered the market, they looked at all, you know, 10 to 12 competitors and mapped them out who is where, mm -hmm. and then plotted a, a, you know, a strategy and then executed well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Think yeah. About so to be okay. honest, this is, um, I will say that like, I don't think that competitive Intel is like one of those um, functions that has like these, that the, that's built out these frameworks and that's been a, in where companies have been around for so long where it's, you know, it's been implemented on. This is something that, you know, when I built out the competitive program over at Zoom Info, uh, it's kind of how, like these are remotely the steps that I took. But then, you know, I recently came over to ClickUp and I kind of did the same thing. And uh, it's really how I was able to kind of get the program up and running, hit the ground running, kind of so to speak. And so instead of like juggling around, trying to figure out like, oh, who are we actually competing against? These are the actual steps that I took um, like three months ago to try to make sure that I was aware of the actual landscape. And so other companies, I'm not so sure. This is what worked for me personally. And so take it with a grain of salt. But yeah, definitely uh, let me know how it works. I think that this should be a pretty straightforward strategy and hopefully it works for you. Cool. All right. So we have audience questions here. So starting with Ryan's question, does sequencing matter in executing this different, uh, executing the different growth levers? What would you recommend as the best sequence in executing considering bootstrap companies of limited resources and me might be difficult to execute all at the same time? Mm, yeah, good question. Um, for growth leverage for you personally, I mean, I have to understand, you know, your business specifically, but I would say community is a really great way to, to start things out. I mean, you can start a community with just a handful of customers. So if you're just starting out, just make sure that you're creating a really great relationship with those customers. Make sure that they're talking with each other as well. And if you can create, you know, a really great dynamic between your customers and between you and your customers, you have a community and you can leverage that. Just continue to build on that momentum. And then as you get more funding and as you start getting more revenue, um, then you can start to figure out how you can educate at scale. Um, the only reason that I don't say educate right off the bat is because typically it takes a lot of money to make sure that that content that you're creating is going to get super widespread and visible. Um, so create that community. You're going to understand really the pain points that your customers are running into. Um, you can create content that addresses that pain point, product that solves that pain point as well. And then as you, like I said, gain momentum, then down the road, you can start to educate your, your audience. And that's, that's probably the, the sequence that I would, I would lean on. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I would add to uh, add here that like the brand thing, in the beginning, if you're a bootstrap startup, just focus on raising awareness that you exist. You don't need to, you know, be 
like Patagonia level, yeah, like yeah, yeah. elaborate brand missions, like later when you get in the scale phase, like yeah. in the beginning, you know, you have bigger battles here. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's the other thing too. They talk about that. Um, number one, I'm a huge fan of your podcast, Pep, How to Win. So like okay. the, there's a, you, you did a really great interview with David Cancel, um, CEO of Drift. And he talked about this too, when it came to brand, like they invested like so much money in like, Hyper growth, the, their big conference, their LinkedIn takeovers. Well, the LinkedIn takeovers are technically free, but in either case, you have to have a lot of employees, right, to make sure that you can technically take over LinkedIn. And so it's it it's great that they focused on brand and it definitely worked for them uh, back in like 2017, 2018 to gain awareness, but it does cost a lot of money. And so definitely uh, maybe a little bit further down the road after you've established a really great product, a really great community, all that good stuff. All right, next question. Stuart is asking, who should be involved in competitive intelligence? How much time would you invest in it in a small marketing team? Mm, yeah, another great question. The coolest thing about competitive intel, in my opinion, is that I feel like anybody could could like could could uh, be responsible for it. Be like the number one person. Like sales, they have a direct line to speaking with customers every single day. So if someone from sales wants to come over and try to run competitive Intel. Like I, I came from sales. I granted, I went from sales to product marketing and then niche down into, into competitive Intel. Um, but that was my path. And so sales is great. Product is great because they are really deep into, you know, the makings of the platform or the app that you're building. And in a lot of cases, you know, if they're a good product manager, they're speaking with customers too, trying to make sure they understand their pain points so that they can build something that, solves those pain points. Um, so there's not really a specific best answer, I don't think. Um, and what was the second, what was the second question or second part How of the How much time would you invest in it in a small team? Yeah, I think in the very beginning, once you're, uh, you know, once you're just starting out, if you have a small team, um, I don't think there's like a specific amount of time, but just make sure that you're creating systems so that's easy to uh, keep track of your market, right? So there's there's different tools that you can use that are going to aggregate all the data that you that you need, um, like Cran and Clue. Um, same with like conversation uh, recording tools like Chorus and Gong. Like these are all tools that can like help aggregate the data for you, and so that you don't need to spend a ton of time researching. If you're on a really limited budget, then obviously you can just ask your sales team to send them free Google surveys. Um, or just create Google alerts for different keywords within your industry. But like I said, that's why I wanted to, in the very beginning, say narrow your focus. Because if you don't narrow your focus down to, to 10 competitors, um, you're going to be like drowning in different, in different vendors. And every single day, something happens in the market. And you're going to be like, oh my God, press release over here. This company just got funding. And most of them, I promise you, most of them, aren't making a huge impact on your bottom line. So just narrow it down to 10. That's going to be easy for one person to manage as long as you create these systems to make it so. So that'd be my recommendation. Beautiful. Uh, question from Ashley. What tips do you have to convince folks that feature comparisons aren't the way to go? So th this is definitely a hot topic within like the competitive Intel community. I think, um, Listen, I've been in a position where like my CRO is asks for a feature comparison and if they need a feature comparison because a customer is asking for it, like create the feature comparison. Okay. Like it's clearly something that they asked for, like the customer specifically asked for, you're probably down the funnel. They need to evaluate you uh, against another competitor. So create the freaking feature comparison, but long-term, right? If we're trying to create like top of funnel content to get the competitor out of the conversation at the beginning of the deal, then just try to, uh, like Pep talked about, like the jobs to be done, focus on that, focus on the benefits that you can offer that you know that another vendor can't. Um, uh, I know we're, we're talking about a lot of like industry darlings. And so apologies in advance for this one, because it's another drift example, but uh, Dave Gerhardt shared in his Facebook group yesterday, it was like uh, how he talked about Drift versus Intercom in the earlier days. And they, they didn't even do a real feature comparison. It was just a block of copy 
And he talked about how, yeah, our DNA is just different. Like they were built for solving the support use case. We're built for solving the sales and marketing use case. And it's, that's perfect. That's all you really need when you're actually having that starting conversation. And then as long as you follow that up with some sort of customer proof point that shows that, yeah, we have solved this pain point and the customer looks exactly like you, a lot of times people aren't going to be asking for feature comparisons, but if they do, and they're a large customer, you know what I mean? Like, that's like when you have to deliver. So you kind of have to play that game, but that'd be my recommendation. Totally. And you can position your competitors. So like to Dave's example of like Drift versus Intercom, they positioned that Intercom cannot solve for these use cases, even though objectively it was bullshit. I was an Intercom user at a time. And I remember talking to Drift sales reps and they were pushing, oh, Intercom is for support. We were using it for marketing and sales <laughs> with great success. Yeah. So it's all a narrative, right? So it you're is, like yeah. you're creating a story. Totally. And yeah, but by that time too, I'm sure Drift had established themselves like with their brand. They've gotten a lot of trust. I'm sure most of their customer stories, they focused on sales and marketing use cases so they could tell it and people would trust them. Mm -hmm. So that's the power of these different growth levers that we talked about in, a, you know, in, in the middle of my presentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. All right, mm -hmm. Andrew, thank you so much. We'll find you on Twitter and LinkedIn. Everybody follow Andrew. And I'll see you later, man. Awesome. Thank you.